everyone. I am uh, I'm so excited about this uh, next conversation that I'm not going to spend too much time doing an introduction of Jeff. And I'm just going to uh, dive into to our questions. But a, a top level overview, for those of you who don't know Jeff, longtime investor, uh, board member for ETS, Ithaca, WeWork, American University, Parchment, um, and a uh, Tony Award winner. So we're going to start off with the, the most important question that all of us have gathered here today to learn, which is, how do we win a Tony? <laughs> well, it's not like the Academy Awards where a few years ago, very controversially, they limited the number of producers. If you've ever seen the Tony Awards on CBS, um, there's literally dozens sometimes on stage. So they have taken some steps to kind of cut down the number. I like to be involved in creating the show though, and so my involvement tends to be kind of early on when we're conceiving of the idea and uh, working with the writer, working with the create, what they call the creative team to uh, really put the show on. Or not, sometimes you, um, you don't go all the way because um, you can't make all the pieces fit together at the right time. I have one of those right now, actually, where we're waiting for a theater, um, and we're not the, the we're ready, but the theater's not for us. So maybe next season. Um, oh. Yeah, I was just going to say, could could you go through the list? I tr I tried to summarize it on the Tonys you've been nominated for and the one that you won. Um, I'm not sure I can. So I've won three. Um, my, my favorite show I've ever been involved with was Spring Awakening. Um, if uh, any of you know that story, it's an old uh, a book that was banned in Germany because it was really about the coming of age of um, sort of high school age kids discovering their, their identity and their sexuality. And, uh, and what was incredibly creative is Duncan Sheik, the composer, uh, put a score uh, to that concept and then um, our choreographer put insane dance moves against it and um, that's kind of launched a bunch of careers um, against that show and really I think inspired a lot of kids, inspired several television shows actually that kind of use the theme of let's put on a show and um, you know let's kind of revive the theater class at high school. Um, so that show really had a big impact on at least one part of the culture. So I'm pretty proud of that one, and I was involved in that all the way through. Um, my co-producer on that one, interestingly, if you remember the movie Amadeus, is the very adult Amadeus, Tom Hulse, who's now doesn't look anything like um, he did 40 years ago, but who else does? Um, and then um, the other two that won Tony's were a uh, revival of an old coward show called Private Lives with Alan Rickman. Um, who passed away a couple of years ago, really quite a genius. Uh, so that was in the revival category. And then in the uh, original play category, one by Edward Albee uh, named um, Sylvia, uh, or What About Sylvia? Uh, Sylvia was a goat, and ostensibly this was about a man who had a tremendous infatuation with a goat named Sylvia. But of course, as Edward Albee said, when he accepted the Tony, he said, I'd like to thank the producers for having the courage to back a show about love, which is what it was a metaphor about. Um, the ones that didn't win, I don't remember. I have no idea. But um, I was um, there were six that I was nominated for that didn't win. I know that. But um, you know, it's uh, I had fun with all of them. I only do them if I believe in the show. I had a lot more that didn't get nominated or didn't win anything that failed miserably, but um, they were still worth doing. I believe they were worth doing. I believed in the endeavor and in the um, in the team that was doing it and um, you know otherwise I wouldn't have been involved but obviously they don't all work out every play every show is like a little company that you're launching um, and you know it's like creating a business and there's rules of the business like every other business and uh, but at the end of the day you put the show on and you hope people like it and you hope they buy tickets and show up and then it has a life my most uh, successful show, which did not win the Tony, but a lot of people think they did because we marketed the Best Actress Tony that we won shamelessly and made people think that maybe we had won the Best Musical Tony, 
was a show called Beautiful about Carol King and her, uh, her career and her art. Uh, and that's still, I think we have five companies of that show uh, touring all over uh, the world. So that, uh, that's probably the best one. I think the few others you didn't win for were Frozen, La Boheme. Um, the reason I, I wanted to drill into this. But not the Disney Frozen. This is a Frozen about a mass murderer. Um, <laughs> it's not a musical. It was a, and um, uh, Swoozie Kurtz uh, was the uh, lead actress. It was a, a great show, but definitely not a Disney musical. <laughs> Um, the reason I wanted to drill into this is this morning we all remember Michael's Seven Seas and I think off of the west coast of South America was creativity. And I spent a lot of my, my day job uh, as heading education for Unity trying to figure out how to teach, capture, assess creativity. Um, and when I was asking you last week about, you know, how, how did you become so creative? What, how do you define that? How, what do you think of it? There were two comments that really struck with me. One was Jeff saying, he did, I did a lot of stumbling around. And then the second comment was, my, <laughs> which stuck with me all weekend with my kids, my parents gave me the gift of low expectations. <laughs> so I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more um, and tell us, the audience, about how you really think those were some of the factors that led to your creativity. Sure. Well, I don't think I'm that unusual because all the kids I grew up with um, had the same low expectations from their families that I did. I would say I was a middle, middle class kid growing up in a very nondescript suburb in New Jersey, about as kind of, you know, sort of middle of the road as you can get. White bread, some people would say. Um, but, you know, I was in incredible culture consumer of every stripe. And um, I guess some of that stuck with me. I can still sing a lot of sitcom jingles from uh, the 60s and 70s, if anyone cares. Um, but, you know, I do think that um, we um, can sometimes fall into the uh, trap of burning our kids out. Um, you know, I live in New York City now. I have four children. Uh, three are still in um, elementary school. And, uh, you know, I had this constant struggle with my wife in a very good-natured way, of course. Um, she grew up in India um, and uh, went to boarding school. Her brothers went to boarding school and very different background than me, which is a beautiful thing, I think. But um, nevertheless, a very different set of ideas about how to raise a kid and how to educate a kid. I, I kind of want to give these kids some breathing space and let them, I always say, let them be bored. Like, we do not have to constantly occupy every moment of their waking day with an activity. Like, let these kids be bored, because sometimes amazing things happen out of boredom, and sometimes sparks start to fly. Sometimes the sparks set a fire that you have to put out, I'll call the fire department. But, you know, other times those are sparks of creativity. So. I'm a big fan of, um, you know, letting the pressure sort of meter creep up as the kids age. There'll be plenty of time for pressure. Obviously, I do appreciate, especially being on the ETS board, that, you know, you've got to perform at certain key moments of your life and that your performance, uh, you know, in, in some ways uh, opens doors for the next stage of your life. Nevertheless, um, you know, I know there's a term popular in New York private school called Krispies, which I'm sure many of you have heard of kids who sort of burn out by the time they're 18 or 19. So I want to keep a little, you know, um, fuel in the tank so that these kids still feel like uh, they have passion for learning and passion for life as they get ready for the next stage. That's just my philosophy. My wife doesn't agree with it at all. <laughs> so. Um Switching gears to your role as the chairperson of the board for ETS, some of you may have missed um, the decision that came out last night in the midst of the Iowa primaries from the question of what should the UC system do with the SATs. So can you give us some, some background on um, that topic, why it came up, and, and what the decision was? Yes, I'm sure you know um, that there's been a hot debate in education and other circles about the value and role of so-called uh, summative assessments or high stakes tests. And, um, you know, I think that I've been uncomfortable that ETS sort of is tagged with 
defending the status quo because I don't think that's the role of any not-for-profit. I think the role is actually to uh, improve, try to improve the slice of society that you're trying to address and try to bring, um, and try to bring innovation in our own way. Um, so the narrative around testing has been quite negative, as you, I'm sure you all know. Um, and I'm also on the board of, uh, of American University here in, here in town. Uh, which went test optional. So um, it's kind of hard to defend high stakes testing at this point, but nevertheless I do, and I did, uh, because I personally viewed myself as a beneficiary of those kinds of tests, having been a pretty average student in high school. Um, and um, you know, I know a lot of people kind of fit my category. What I was hesitant about was how my extrapolating my experience to the broader population because I realized that you know that's a trap that you don't want to fall into. Uh, but what was super interesting to me about the findings of this uh, UC panel, and it was quite an august group of um, social scientists and researchers and uh, academicians, was the correlation of access to, um, to, to performance on these tests. As you know, the debate is, do we just drop these tests all together and just use a combination of GPA and non-cognitive factors? Um, and it was a pretty decisive statement about the value of testing used in conjunction with those other things, with uh, high school GPA and with non-cognitive factors. Uh, to increase appreciably both the um, predictability of performance in the first year, which is what the SAT is designed to do, um, and then also the uh, performance over four years, getting to graduation. Um, but the most surprising thing was which uh, subgroups or cohorts uh, had the most benefit from these tests. And uh, the lowest number in um, it's, I think it's about 25% improvement over the control group was Caucasian. Um, the next highest was Asian. Next highest was uh, Native American. And the highest uh, by, uh, in the 90s was African American. So that was kind of eye-opening for people. It's what um, a lot of people at ETS have believed, but it was nice to have that um, reinforcement. Uh, so I'm sure the debate is going to rage for decades uh, further, as it should, because the job of ETS and College Board and ACT and others who do these tests is to continue to try to ensure that they are what they're designed to be, which is a tool for access um, and not a tool for denial of access. I think you all know that the original inspiration of these tests was really to break the stronghold of the East Coast elites in getting access to the elite East Coast schools. And so um, they have not always fulfilled that ambition, that's for sure, but um, you know, it's a work in progress. Um, one other thing that was probably not as um, uh, well noticed was that the uh, UC system announced that they want to move to a new version of a test. And so uh, instead of doing a summative assessment at the end of a, some kind of a process, do um, formative or continuous assessments over a long, longer period of time. But this is a, uh, also gonna be a long transition cycle. They talked about nine years before they're in. So um, I view that as an opportunity for ETS and College Board and ACT to continue to advance the science of assessment so that they do what they're meant to do, which is creating opportunity and not barriers. Thanks, that's a, that's a great overview. Um, exciting to, to see the challenge and that they'll still continue with it, but that there is a, a, a dedication to innovation to think about new approaches. To your point, rapid speed of nine years, but <laughs> maybe it'll be faster. Yeah, well, we'll see if it's an overnight success. But, um, you know, ETS has been doing uh, a lot of non-cognitive assessment work. They have over 300 uh, scientists um, there in um, Princeton or Lawrenceville. Um, you know, amazing people doing um, everything uh, from psychometricians and psychiatrists, uh, data scientists, statisticians, et cetera. So um, 
and there's a lot of frontiers uh, where that those kinds of um, uh, assessments can be put to work. Um, we've heard a lot about, we're here to talk about the future of work and how learning and work kind of bridge or learning bridges to work. Um, but, you know, the um, most of the assessments that people take in life are done as gateways to education and not as gateways to employment. And, you know, we all know that high schools no longer really can afford to have a robust, most high schools, a robust guidance counselor, um, you know, process. So, you know, these are all what I view as opportunities for ETS and others in the private sector to design tests that uh, are not barriers, but actually guideposts to people to help find, um, you know, where they can be most fulfilled and where they can make the biggest contribution. So looking at the broader landscape from pre-K to gray globally, where do you see the greatest opportunities for investment and where are you looking? So I should probably back up a half step and just talk about um, my firm and what we do. Um, so um, my, I was a career, had a career on Wall Street. I worked at Morgan Stanley most of my career back uh, in 2008 in the middle of the uh, financial crisis. Uh, my partner and I decided to start a new firm. It seemed like a good time. And um, he was from Goldman Sachs. Uh, some, some of you probably know that Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs are kind of uh, notorious competitors. So, um, uh, and his mom is uh, someone, some of you in the room might know, Diane Ravitch. Um, so my partner's name is Joe Ravitch. Uh, that's where we got the rain as a portmanteau, the RA from him and the INE from me, rain. In case you're wondering, um, the um, so we decided what we would do was create a firm that would both invest and advise, aka a merchant bank. So we've raised uh, funds over the years to invest in companies where we thought we had some particular expertise to help them grow, uh, and we also do advisory work. But the sector we work in is tech, media, telecom, TMT which is what I've spent my whole career working in. So the Broadway thing is just, you know, a side gig. Um, the, um, I call it the backwater of the entertainment industry. The, um, so we've decided that with it as a small firm, as a startup, what could we focus on where we could actually have a competitive advantage? Because you've got firms out there who can write billion dollar, five billion dollar checks without blinking an eye. And for us, when we were starting, um, a 30 to $50 million check was kind of a full size commitment. Now our fund's a little bigger, maybe it's 100, but we're still battling out against much bigger firms. So we decided that the core that we were investing against was intellectual property. Um, and so that's expressed in your industry in games, in gaming. It's expressed in sports, it's expressed in entertainment. Uh, we put together a board of partners, people like uh, William Morris Endeavor, Ari Emanuel, Ted Forsman back in the day. Um, and um, education, to be honest with you, was one of the areas that I um, originally focused on. I have a long tradition uh, back when education was a packaged good market, back in the 90s when it was, I'm talking about textbooks. Um, and like most packaged goods businesses in the entertainment industry, you know, think uh, CDs, think um, movies with um, DVDs, um, and really that's what a book is, it's a packaged good. Uh, so you can control your distribution channel, you can control your margins, you control access. Uh, and like most other businesses, the internet completely disrupted that. Uh, it just took a little longer for the internet to find the education or vice versa, but it's now caught up in you know, full living color. Um, it hit the music industry probably first of all those industries, but I see a lot of parallels there. Um, we have um, in this uh, group, Matt Patinsky. Is Matt here somewhere? Um, so, there's Matt. Um, so Matt is the uh, one of the few ed tech companies that we invested in over the course of the last 10 years. Uh, his company is Parchment. Parchment deals in education credentials. Um, to um, really enable learners and also um, the custodians of those credentials. So it's a, it's a SaaS firm, uh, and that's been a great ride. Uh, we just um, sold Parchment um, a couple of days, closed yesterday, right, Matt? 
uh, to, um, to another company, so that was good. Congratulations, Matt. Um, but to be honest, looked at a lot of other ed tech companies over the years and um, didn't really find a lot that I thought kind of met the sweet spot of being a really great investment and a really great company. Um, sometimes it's a really great company, but the valuation has been driven up to the point where hard to see where you get the returns as an investor. So I kind of flipped my focus uh, over the last 10 years, as you can tell, from uh, being, um, being a big investor in education to trying to contribute uh, my expertise as a board member uh, of various uh, nonprofits. So American University was the first one. Uh, I had a friendship over the years with a guy named Bill Bowen uh, who uh, was the legendary president of Princeton and then the Mellon Foundation. So Bill recruited me to join Kevin Guthrie's board. Where's Kevin? Um, so he's Ithaca. Uh, Ithaca has JSTOR. You may know JSTOR. So been on that board. And then um, uh, obviously uh, ETS, where I'm now the board chair. So I find tremendous satisfaction in helping those CEOs who are running really great businesses uh, but business with a mission orientation uh, try to navigate the challenges and the opportunities that they uh, find every day. But um, as an investor, uh, personally, I found education to be uh, challenging on the scale that we operate. I think it's, um, you know, we don't really have an active venture investing platform. We're, we're more late stage, so looking for companies that have already kind of achieved exit velocity. And by the time they achieve exit velocity in this market, they are kind of priced out of our price range. All right, thank you. Um, so speaking of overvalued, one, one could say, I'd love to hear more about your experience with WeWork um, and more of the inside scoop. From the outside, I think most of us read it was a, a CEO with a huge amount of hubris, uh, all white male board, no real checks and balances. But given that you've come in as part of the takeover, soft bank takeover, would love to hear your view. Well, speaking as a white male. Um, <laughs> Have you diversified the board yet? <laughs> uh, I haven't, no. Um, well, I should go back. So going back to 1995, I helped a guy named Masio Sasan, SoftBank, uh, founder of SoftBank, uh, buy his first business ever in the US. Um, company which some of you may remember uh, called NetWorld plus Interop. And then we quickly bought another thing called Ziff Davis and then another thing called Comdex. Uh, believe it or not, Comdex for a long time was the largest trade show in the world. So bought all those things, took it public. Um, and then when the crash of 2001 happened, we kind of dismantled it and sold it off. But um, I've been sort of through a lot of adventures with, uh, we call him Masa, Masio Sasan, over that entire period of time, so 25 years. And um, I would say that, um, you know, WeWork was an example of uh, kind of a high velocity investing, as I, I would call it, um, which does not always end well. Um, the, um, I got the call to come in when it was clear that um, some changes needed to be made, the company needed capital, the capital that SoftBank and the Vision Fund provided was um, really the capital that was required to keep the company going. And so what usually happens when you find yourself in that situation as a company is that the prior rounds of equity get revalued. Um, those prior investors get reduced in their ownership um, and the new money sort of um, is able to affect uh, change in structure, governance, et cetera. One of the changes, obviously, that we thought was important was to change management. And you may have seen this week that we made a further change in management. Um, and really what was happening was that uh, Adam Newman, who is the uh, CEO that you're referring to, had built an incredible brand. It really was an amazing brand. And, and amazingly, maybe to the people who read the financial press every day, it still is an amazing brand. So the one piece of uh, research that was very important was brand research to determine that most employees still view the idea of working in a WeWork environment as a premium employment experience. 
So, um, you know, that was a that was a core finding to get confidence in putting seven billion dollars of additional capital into that company. Um, what had gone wrong in that company, and I've seen this before, although I, I would agree that we work as an extreme example of this phenomenon, is that they moved in too many different directions at the same time, and it's very hard to execute um, when you get past the number of things anyone can keep in their head at the same time, which is, I think, where they were. So they were getting into countries and lines of businesses and um, uh, financial models, et cetera, that were um, challenging to keep it all together. But if you kind of, and this is why I look at any company, if you kind of looked at the unit economics, if you looked at the economics of we work on a building by building, a city by city basis, there was a strong and profitable company in there that wanted to break out, but there was a lot of things going on around that company. And so our challenge was and is remains to take all those other things out of the mix and focus on what's working, get it to sustainability, which is profit, and, um, and then you can have a little more latitude for the next big adventure. But right now, the focus is execution, maintaining that brand at all costs. That's sort of the holy grail in these things is the consumer vi vision of that brand that they still have to believe when they walk into that place that they're getting a superior experience, which, you know, there's all sorts of research we have about retention and satisfaction and so forth. I'm not saying it's universal and I'm not saying it's everyone, but it's, it's, it's the majority and it's, um, you know, it's backed up by pretty significant research that the brand is still very much intact and that's really the investment case that um, SoftBank supported. Thanks. That's a great, great lesson for all of us. Um, are we out of time or we get to questions? Great. Thank you. We'll open it up for questions. Yeah. Actually, it actually dovetails the educa your education experience, Jeff, with, um, with the WeWork. Because one of the things they were doing, and, and part of it seemed relatively out there, but part of it seemed logical to me, was adding some of these education assets into the business. Now, you know, starting K-12 is a little more daunting than, than actually, you know, buying, um, buying a flat iron and things like that. But is there, I mean, I appreciate you all have to get your legs back underneath you, but is there a, um, a continuing thesis that the WeWork platform, and, and it, it certainly dovetails with all the themes we're talking about here today about integrating work and learning. So I'm just curious if you guys have any early insights on that part. So, Deborah, thank you for that. It's an area of intense interest for the management and the board and the prior management, as you know. Um, but as you kind of alluded to, the idea of running an elementary school, um, I think it was a K-6 school, um, seemed a little bit off mission uh, for where that company was right now. Um, what's much more related to the mission is sort of job transition, skill transition, skill attainment, et cetera. So there's a lot of work that's going on in that area and um, that they continue to do. And we've had a couple of interesting uh, conversations just this week about um, helping specific kinds of skill sets and uh, kind of creating an aggregation of people who have a common interest, let's say around architecture, or interior design, uh, as just two examples. But there'll be a lot more of that to come. Uh, you know, it's, it's a little early to get deep into partnering, but we don't even have a, um, a new head of biz dev yet, but um, I, it's, we've got to get there um, pretty quickly. Hi there. What crossover do you see in the media space and the ed tech space? Um, you know, obviously, Brain Group's done some investments in that area, and there's a lot of crossover in the merchandising, but also in the learning outcome. Yeah, well, um, our moderator of this panel is um, kind of an expert in that area. Uh, we were sort of reminiscing on the phone the other day about um, various people who have tried to gamify education, and um, I guess you've been involved in a number of uh, uh, experiments in the past. I have as well. 
Um, we know there's a pony there, as they say. Um, no one has quite, you know, find it, found out how to ride that pony yet, but um, there, it's an interesting area. Um, American University here in town has a game design lab. Uh, they're working with, um, with schools, with um, manufacturers. But, you know, things like um, the uh, uh, persistence uh, around a task, things like, uh, you know, voluntarily repeating that task, uh, attaining skill levels, getting rewards for those skill levels. I mean, these are all sort of built in as part of fundamental part of game design. And obviously these are words that will be familiar to you as educators. Um, and so there's a clear crossover. I think everyone can see it. I don't think the, um, the business model has been unlocked yet, but you would have a good view on that. What do you think? Yeah, having, having personally made a lot of mistakes in that area, I think, I think the key was that I was looking at it from the wrong angle which is how are, how, are, how are we bringing gaming into the system or institution of education? And as soon as I swapped that, my work now at Unity is um, basically starting, you know, almost pre-K to gray um, in essentially the whole arc of workforce development with gaming. As soon as, as soon as I swapped that and thought about going to where the video game players already are, and we like to say, you know, people don't jump out of bed in the morning and say, I can't wait to become a Salesforce administrator. But they do jump out of bed in the morning wanting to become a game developer. And so we've been able to unlock that passion combined with really clear earning potential on the other side of that equation to really motivate people who don't usually come from the same background to be able to earn an excellent living in, in the space. And now that's translating into to multiple industries, obviously, with the evolution of 3D into architecture and construction and auto design and film and media. I mean, the reason why I'm actually optimistic, I know it's a raging debate about the future of work and where will the jobs be because the population keeps increasing, although not as fast as it used to, um, is because the um, business models keep evolving. Um, we're investors in a company called DraftKings, which started as a fantasy sports company um, the, uh, we had legal issues with the New York Attorney General, which were resolved a while ago. Supreme Court said you can actually bet on the game. It's legal as long as you do it in conjunction with the state approval, which we're doing now. That business is growing. It's a, the reason why the sports leagues like it is because it keeps people tuned in to the game. Even if the outcome of the game is decided, the outcome of your particular involvement with the DraftKings experience or the FanDuel experience will continue all the way through. And you'll actually want to watch all the other games in the league. So this is why the leagues like it, not because people are betting on the outcomes of games. They're not allowed to do that. You bet on the performance. You become the manager, the general manager, and you uh, bet on your own skill in picking people who are going to perform that day across a variety of games. So it kind of creates a composite game. But my point is that's a business model that didn't even exist. We, don't, we didn't have to hire any new players, but we did have to hire a lot of software developers, a lot of engineers, a lot of people, lawyers, to go out and negotiate with the states. Um, a lot of skill sets that um, are in short supply. And for the media industry, which is where I've spent most of my career, um, it's not about selling more ads, and it's not about selling more subscriptions. It's creating a transaction model somewhere in between those two that never existed before, so, you know, we just took that business public um, at a $4 billion market cap. So, you know, I'm optimistic that uh, creativity uh, really brought about by the broadband explosion and by the uh, computing explosion, especially the small computers in our pocket, you know, mobile phones are going to, it's going to continue to create opportunity, um, you know, and so I'm, I'm betting on the, uh, creativity of the American workforce, but obviously the big thing is how do we channel people into the right opportunities? Uh, and that's what we've invested. We've invested in a lot of, we have a game company in India we just invested in called Remy Circle, which is exploding in India. We invested in a game company in Germany called Huge, with uh, four U's, I think, um, which is uh, doing casual, what are called casual games. So these are industries that didn't exist even five years ago, and who knows what we're going to have in five years. So I wouldn't be too pessimistic about the future of work and about the ability of this 
country to create opportunities, but we have to keep educating people and keep pulling up uh, the undereducated so that they can kind of, um, you know, have the same opportunity that, um, you know, my kids have in, uh, in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, for example. All right. Well, thanks, Jeff, so much. My it pleasure. was a real pleasure.